if you can't help us with something, it's because there isn't assistance available or, you know, there isn't knowledge for that help rather than that because, you know, we could get better help somewhere else. Yeah. Anyway, Tim, I'm going to mute myself again because we're being recorded. Oh, well, <laughs> no, not, not, not quite. Um, I right. had to... yeah, James is back. So, um, yeah, the recording's on. So here we go. Over to you, Hector. Do yeah. start again. Um, uh, Tim, uh, do you like me to? Uh, would you like me to answer some of the questions that they were, they were, uh, or what, sh what should we do? Uh, uh, gosh, I, I don't know how to just. Whoops, I put yeah. myself on mute. No, um, I don't know how to decide that. Well, um, maybe, maybe I can ask this question that were already in the chat uh, because they were um, referring to the the things we have already seen, and then I can finish. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, okay. we don't have we don't have much. So there was a question here: What does a tight clothing clothing refer to? Um, so basically. This, uh, this was related to the, to the spasticity, to the stiffness. Sometimes um, just by touch in patients with severe spasticity, just by touching the, the skin, uh, you can, um, you can um, provoke uh, a spasm. So if the patient is wearing very tight clothing, um, um, socks or something like that, that could uh, contribute to the, um, uh, to the spasm. So this is one of the things that we, that we need to advise in patients with severe um, spasticity. Uh, then uh, I just wanted, uh, because there was a comment that, uh, so what I wanted to, to, to explain today is that uh, you can have symptoms that are related to the ataxia, but it's true that not everything that happens has to be related to the ataxia. Okay, we because this is this is um, we always need to find the the middle point. So it's not correct the attitude of oh all these things that are happening to me doesn't have anything to don't have anything to do with the ataxia or the other way uh, the other extreme that everything that happens uh, uh, is because of the ataxia. Um, and this is a common mistake um, uh, in the medical with my other colleagues that don't have uh, expertise in ataxia that maybe um, you tell them a symptom that is not related to the ataxia and they say, oh, no, no, this is because of your, or your condition. So that's a very good uh, point that you have to understand that not everything that happens is the ataxia. So... It it was me. It was it was me that asked that question, Hector. Um, <clears throat> and the, the reason for it is that it's I've I've considered it far too easy to always blame ataxia for everything that happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's something silly like you might have a stomach upset or a headache or something, and blame ataxia, but it's not necessarily always the case. Exactly. Yeah. If I can add to that, we had um, a discussion in our group about me memory loss. Hmm. And you seem to be saying that it's not to do with the taxia. I know we're, we're all different, but that was interesting hearing that. I mean, I, I, could, I can't blame you on a taxia just like that, which yeah. I think I was. Yeah. So, for instance, uh, if you if you think that uh, you could have uh, or someone uh, could have memory loss, it's very important mm -hmm. that uh, you tell us, and we have to assess and to see if that could be related to the ataxia or something else could be happening. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank but you. Follow, following on from what Peter said, uh, I find that kind of in, in, interesting, or particularly interesting, it was my question about, um, or my comment about, um, that I've always thought that my lack of attention was to do with the fact that I was tired. Yeah, so... Um, but you're actually suggesting that lack of attention can be a direct symptom of ataxia, I think you're said. are you suggesting yeah. that? Yeah, so, so basically, uh, sometimes it's very difficult to, um, uh, to really know what's the, the, the true reason for those symptoms. And probably it's a combination of everything. So we know that problems with attention are very common in neurological conditions. 
So in many in, uh, conditions, multiple sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's disease, and so on. And some patients with ataxia, they can have a uh, lack of attention just because of the ataxia. But for instance, if you don't have lack of attention because of the ataxia, you could have also lack of attention because you are very tired or you don't sleep well, or you are depressed, for instance. And in patients with uh, ataxia, probably it's a combination. Not every patient with ataxia is the same. Not all the ataxias are the same, but probably in the majority, in the, for the most part of the patients, probably it's a combination of different things. So this is why it's very important that we try to treat the fatigue, the low mood, and so on. Derek, you want to come in? My, my, yes, my, my thinking on that is that the, the fatigue I, I get is unquestionably a direct result of ataxia in that I don't do things instinctively anymore. I have to, as I'm walking along, I have to go almost left, right, left, right as I'm doing so. And therefore, what happens is I'm not necessarily physically tired at, after a period, but I am certainly <clears throat> mentally tired. And, and that therefore are mentally fatigued, which I distinct, I think there's a difference between being tired and fatigued. And as a result of being fatigued, my attention and, and so on is impaired as well. Yeah, yeah. So this is a this is a very good example that probably um, in the mornings you are completely fine and your attention is fine and and you feel yourself yourself more more quickly more perky. But at the end of a busy day, it's like don't try to uh, yeah. <laughs> to tell me anything because I won't I won't remember. That is a very clear example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah, carrying on about fatigue, um, I saw an OT at Queen Square um, a while ago, a couple of years, and she was saying that when you have ataxia, you have to often work so hard to get the symptoms, you get fatigued. That's, you know, I mean, is that... That's different to fatigue from ataxia. That what I'm talking about is fatigue from working against the symptoms. Or are the, the well, <laughs> what's your comment to what I've just said? Yeah, so you are saying that the that the fatigue is different from the normal fatigue. Well, you know? I'm I'm asking you actually. When you say ataxia can, can be a cause of the fatigue. Do you mean a drug cause or the working against the symptoms makes one fatigued? Yeah, yeah. So as I said, it's very, very difficult to, to say. And uh, fatigue is one of the symptoms that <clears throat> we have been studying the less in neurological conditions. So it's a little bit too, it's a little bit complicated to understand, but it seems that in neurological conditions, just because of the condition, you can have fatigue. So for instance, uh, so if you probably in some patients with ataxia, even though you don't do anything at all during the day, you feel fatigue. That's what I mean, that sometimes even without doing uh, anything, you can feel fatigue, you can feel yeah. Exactly. And then on top of that, obviously, because of the problems with the movement, it takes you more energy, let's say, to perform any activity. So that puts uh, uh, more fatigue on top of that. And if you are uh, a little bit down or depressed, that makes things even harder. So as I said, we can't say, uh, oh, your fatigue is only due to this reason, one reason. No, probably there are several things happening there. Um, but we know it's a very, very, very common symptom and in, it appears across uh, the different conditions. So um, there's probably a little bit of the condition 
a little bit of the effort of performing exercise, the, uh, your activities, a little bit of the mood. So it's probably a combination of things. Hmm. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move us on um, because there was another comment from Stan actually about yeah. uh, St. John's Wort and whether that works for, is helpful with low mood and anxiety. Yeah. So um, and actually, we had it. Sorry, to just just to fill it. Yeah. Just possibly you want to bring that in as well. There were other other things that we talked about as supplements that might help. Yeah. Thank so um, so I can I can reply maybe to the specifically to the San John's uh, words, and then we can comment a little bit in the diet because of and supplements because it was on my slides. So. So just as a general rule, um, well, first of all, uh, to be honest, I don't have any, any information on the uh, St. John's words if it's uh, useful for mood or anxiety. Um, the only recommendation, that, and this is, this is really, really important for you guys, um, be very careful with all these natural products and so on, because some of them can, um, can have effects on your body that you are not aware of. Uh, what I mean is that in the particular case of the St. John's uh, Wars, uh, I think this kind of herb uh, interferes with the function of the liver, okay? So if you are taking other medication, uh, because normally most of the medication are processed in the liver, if you are taking other medication and you start taking St. John's uh, Wars, it can interfere on how your body is uh, processing that medication. Um, and it can affect in different ways. So maybe the other medication you are taking, it reduces its efficacy or it makes the levels to go up to a toxic level, okay? So please be very, very, very careful. Ask your doctors when you take any other um, supplements or any kind of herbs because some of them, they, they have effects, okay? And, and can I interrupt? And I know Harriet wants to say something. Can we bring you in, Harriet? Because I know Harriet's got a medical background. So, and you're on mute, Harriet. So, yeah. I was just going to say that so, Hector's is absolutely right. That um, sorry, Hector, I was a I'm, I'm medically a medically retired um, psychiatrist. Um, so St John's Wort um, is if you're taking certain types of antibiotic, you have to be very careful because it makes the antibiotic less um, effective. I think warfarin as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it can affect uh, warfarin, yeah. 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 Uh, so, and this is really, really important, guys, uh, because the problem is that, uh, uh, I mean, as you think is an, is a safe uh, herb or something like that, uh, you might even forget to tell your doctors so we don't know that you are taking this and we don't know why the medication is not working and we keep on, uh, on increasing the dose of those and it could, um, there, are, there are always cases in the, in the medical journals of uh, someone uh, uh, taking this kind of herbs and something else happened. So please be very, very careful. And if you take them, uh, let your GPs or your, or your doctors know, okay? Um, so if you want, guys, I can continue with the presentation because it's very short what I, what I have left, so... Go, go ahead. I think, I think we might have a little bit of attention left. Okay. <laughs> we, you won't need uh, much, so um, because we were already... Um, okay, perfect. So, um, because Tim also asked me how uh, we were doing in the clinic right now. Uh, basically, you know that uh, during all the lockdown, we uh, were doing mainly telephone clinics. But now, since August this year, I think, we started to do some face-to-face -face clinics. Basically, now we are um, doing one every other week. So every, every two weeks, we have one one face-to-face -face clinic. Normally, we tend to bring to the face-to-face -face clinic those patients who are new patients, so the patients who uh, we have uh, not seen uh, before in the clinic, or patients who really need to be seen because they have something new or they have deteriorated. 
if you see if you come now to to see us uh, in clinics you'll see that uh, all of us are wearing the uh, PPE, the personal protective equipment. So I'll be with a mask, the gloves, the apron, a visor. So it seems that we are going to space instead of uh, going to clinic. <laughs> um, and also the patients have to wear a mask. Uh, you would have your temperature checked before you, uh, you enter the department and you have to um, answer some questions, uh, some screen questions about, have you had any contact with someone uh, with suspected COVID uh, and so on. Um, and obviously now we tend to, to have reduced number of slots and also the number of slots in other department are reduced. So if you have, to, uh, if you have ever come to one of our Thursday clinics, you know that um, it's really, really busy. There's a lot of people in the corridors and so on. That's not the situation right now because now um, the hospital is trying uh, not to have many patients in the waiting room, for instance. So this is why the number of slots is uh, reduced. And another important change, for instance, is that we don't have um, the volunteer from Ataxia UK uh, in the afternoons. Um, so this is also uh, a little bit of a, of a drawback now of the situation. Um, and then the rest of the time we are working with telephone appointments. These are mainly done by Professor Junchi and, and Susan Booth, our clinical nurse specialist. Um, and we have been trying to do our best to try to, uh, to keep our patients safe uh, during this time uh, with, um, with the telephone appointments. Um, and finally, uh, Tim also gave me some, some previous questions that you have been already discussing among you. So for instance, I think there was one uh, regarding weakness in ataxia. So when, when, we, when a neurologist think of weakness is loss of power. For instance, in your hands would be the loss of grip, no? Um, Weakness in ataxia can appear uh, because, for instance, if you have a form of ataxia that um, that makes um, uh, your nerves uh, that makes that your nerves are not working properly, apart from all the pins and needles and so on, you can have weakness. Okay, so if you think you you have weakness, you have to tell us, and in clinic we will test different things to check if it's a problem of the nerves, for instance. Uh, but it also can appear as, um, as a consequence of the lack of activity. Um, everyone, if it's uh, doing uh, very little activity during the, during the day for long periods of time, it's likely that you are going to experience some weakness. The most extreme cause for um, the most extreme situation, for instance, would be uh, so these patients that spend a lot of time in the intensive care unit. For instance, now we have seen with COVID a lot of them that they spend, I don't know, two months, for instance, in the uh, intensive care unit. And then when they want to, um, when they are discharged from the intensive care unit, they are completely uh, weak, they have lost uh, muscle, and so on. So you can have weakness in ataxia, either because of it's uh, something linked to the condition or as a consequence of the, of the lack of activity. Then another question was regarding the worsening of symptoms during lockdown. Um, I think you, you were all very uh, sensible to say this, um, use it or lose it, right? Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, uh, especially Susan Booth who has been uh, very much in contact with the patients by phone during these months. This is something that almost everyone with, uh, with ataxia has uh, reported that, um, that you have experienced a, a worsening of your symptoms during the lockdown. And this is probably related to, to the lack of activity you have spent the last uh, eight months or six months locked at home, probably some of you or most of you uh, guys have been shielding at home. So, so yeah, this is a very common situation. We have seen that uh, most of our patients feel that the, the mobility and also the speech you were saying uh, has deteriorated. So it seems that it's uh, related to the lack of activity. And then a very common question, the diet and um, food supplements. 
So in general, but for very rare types of ataxia uh, that have uh, that we have to uh, treat them through some changes in the diet. In general, there's no specific diet or any type of specific food that we recommend for ataxia. The most important thing is that you have a healthy diet because you have to avoid as much as possible to be overweight. Because if you are overweight, that's another um, thing that can worsen your balance and that can damage your joints. So the most important thing is a, um, a healthy diet and avoid uh, being overweight. Uh, in terms of supplements, uh, as I said, uh, but for very rare types of ataxia, there's no specific supplements that are um, recommended in ataxia. Uh, the only important thing would be to have the supplements you need in case you have any vitamin deficiency. So for instance, in this country, because of the lack of sunlight and now uh, during the lockdown in COVID, uh, vitamin D deficiency, I'm sure it's very, very common. So if you go to your GP and they test for the vitamin D and, um, and you have low vitamin D, you'll have to um, take vitamin D. And also because uh, with all the COVID, uh, the, um, the World Health Organization, they saw that there was a relationship of immunity with also vitamin D. So it's also important for that. Um, so in general, for supplements, I would recommend that only the ones you need. There's no evidence, there's no proof that a particular type of supplement can help with ataxia. There was another question about coenzyme Q10. Uh, for some forms of ataxia, specifically Friedrich's ataxia, there are some studies that uh, suggest that the CoQ10 can help a little bit with the fatigue. So if you are suffering from fatigue, sometimes in clinics, we try the CoQ10. Uh, there are patients who feel that it could help a little, a little bit and we can keep it. And some patients, they say, listen, this hasn't made any difference, so I'm going to stop it. Um, so if you are feeling, uh, if you are feeling fatigue, uh, we can try uh, CoQ10 if, uh, if, uh, if you discuss that with your neurologist. Um, there was another comment about uh, one other supplement, uh, ashwagandha, I think it's uh, called. Um, I don't have any specific inform, any specific data about that. I know I've seen some certain things on the internet about it's very good for for a lot of different things, but we don't have um, strong evidence of that. So as I said, the same with the San John's uh, words, uh, be very careful. If you are taking it, let us know so that we know that you are um, taking that but uh, I can't recommend that uh, because we don't have evidence that it's helpful for, for you guys. And then there was also a question about CBD, which is a very um, trendy, uh, trendy topic, I think right now. Um, I'm a little bit, um, um, I don't know if I would say angry uh, with these CBD people because if you see um, their, their, their ads, uh, it seems that CBD can be used for, for any, any kind of uh, problem you have in life or almost. Uh, and in general with someone, sorry, with, uh, when something works for everything, it means that probably doesn't really work uh, for, not, for anything. Um, so it's true that we use uh, derivates or of, uh, cannabis in certain neurological conditions in multiple sclerosis and in some cases of very, very severe epilepsy. But there's no uh, evidence there. We don't have proof that CBD can help in conditions like Parkinson's disease, ataxia, and so on. So if you ask me, should I have CBD? I would say I can't recommend the CBD. And the other thing is that cannabinoids, when they are taken by mouth normally, um, they have what we call an erratic absorption, which means that the amount you absorb through your gut is not always the same and it can vary. So we have seen cases of 
people that get intoxicated because for instance, they start having a dose and they don't feel anything, they increase the dose and then they get intoxicated. So again, you have to be very, very careful uh, about these uh, compounds. Uh, also, although in theory, CBD don't, doesn't give you all the, um, the, the emotional and the cognitive um, consequences of the, of the cannabinoids, sometimes they can produce some um, cognitive effects. So, so the bottom line is that I can't recommend this. And if you decide to try it yourself, please be very careful and let us know. I, my advice would be don't try anything that is uh, sold on over the internet. You have to trust uh, your doctors. Um, I know that sometimes um, patients, uh, so, some patient has uh, told me, oh, but the problem is that doctors don't think out of the box and so on. We don't think out of the box because the first thing we care about is the safety of our patients. We can't prescribe things. We can't give you things that we don't know if they are giving you a benefit because almost any kind of drug we take, uh, we take has side effects. Even the, the most uh, innocent ones like uh, paracetamol, ibuprofen, all of them have side effects. So when we prescribe a medication is because we know that, they, uh, that it's helping you, okay? So be very careful with all the supplements and things that you um, you buy through the internet or over the counter if uh, if they have not been prescribed by a by a doctor. Okay, you have to be very sensible. Uh, I perfectly understand that sometimes it's very frustrating not having a treatment for ataxia, and you are willing to try anything that uh, that can work. But you have to bear in mind that most of these things they have side effects. Okay. Um, and that was uh, all. I hope I have uh, asked, uh, have I answered your questions. Can I see what, something what, now? Hang on, hang on a minute, Ronnie. Uh, okay. What I would, what, what I, I, thank you very much, um, Hector. And could, could you think, yeah, you, and now I can see everybody on my screen, I think. And um, I know we've been going for about an hour and a half. And I wonder if, if you could just give, if you've got a question, could you oh, give hey. me a show, if you could, could you give me a show of hands because I want to just know how many questions are outstanding. Because, uh, okay, I can see three hands. Yeah, okay, it sounds, um, and I'm just, just going to take those three questions because I think we've been going on for quite a long time. Yes, my back. And um, it, both it will, um, it, it's been very kind of Hector to give up most of his Sunday evening for us yes. uh, and to give us all a break. So. Uh, um, so, um, Ronnie, do you want to, we, we, should we go Ronnie and Norman and then John in that order? Ronnie, do you want to uh, ask your question? My, my, it's not more of a question, it's just a statement, but it's sort of a question to Hector. Um, my, my memory isn't too good. So when I forget people's names and they're important to me, I play a little game, I say, uh, I, I say, what's her or his name to, in my head? And um, I've got it written down somewhere, but before I look at the person, before I look at the piece of paper, I say, um, Tim, let's say. Um, and if I'm right, I give myself a pat on the head. And if I'm wrong, I say, do it again. I do it again. I do it again. So, um, that is a good idea for memory loss. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a good strategy uh, because it helps you. Uh, probably there's uh, some reinforcement when you uh, you uh, you treat yourself with this part uh, on the head. Yeah. Um, also, I think that um, I mean sometimes uh, you might find it a little bit difficult, but I mean sometimes be open to people and, yeah. and don't get stressed and say. Um, I'm really sorry, I apologize. I have um, a neurological problem and my memory yes. is very good. Sorry, I forgot your name. Can you repeat it uh, again? Yes, um, but my, my thing is, um, don't use a taxi as an excuse. 
No, no, obviously, no. I'm not saying <laughs> that you you have to use it uh, as an excuse, but um, mm. but obviously, if you feel uh, anxious, because some people they can feel very anxious about this interview, yes. and the the easy ways to say, okay, I'm not going to meet anyone because I don't yes. remember their names. No. Yes. So before doing that, yes, try to be open and say, listen, this yes. is my problem. Yes, mm -hmm. I go to church. I go to I'm gonna, sorry, I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you, Ronnie, okay. because I want to move okay. us on. But I, I just okay. want to say that there used to be somebody who came to our group. Uh, some of you will remember him, called Dimitar, uh, and he introduced himself by saying, "My name is Dimitar." Like the foot, he knew. I think he knew I was a football fan, like the footballer Dimitar Berbatov, and I've never forgotten his name because of that. And I think that's a bit like what Ronnie was just saying. It's a kind of trick. Uh, yes. Norman, over to, over to you. Are you happy? Hi, uh, how are you? I'm okay. How are you, Norman? I'm good. Um, Professor Junty mentioned uh, you might be doing clinical trials. Uh, I just want to know how far we are with that. Yeah. So, so basically, now the the things uh, in general for the clinical trials are a little bit um, halted because of the COVID situation. Uh, actually, um, we were about to, uh, to start a trial for Friedrich's ataxia uh, and it got delayed because of the COVID. But now the general situation is that um, studies are being delayed because obviously for the clinical trials, uh, the participants have to come to the center several times and now we are trying to uh, reduce that. Um, I mean, the, the, the answer would be, we are closer to them, but uh, they are not happening next month. Okay, thank but, you. But in general, the patients who are coming to our center, you know that you are in our list um, yeah. <laughs> and we are going to, to call you, don't worry, don't worry. Yeah. Mm. And we've got one, we'll take one more question from, from, from John, who, our new, our new uh, member. John. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for letting me join you. This might be a silly question, and I apologise. I just wondered if Hector or any, any other member of the group had any tips on walking. I'm finding I can't walk more than four or five feet and I'm relying on a walking frame, which I'm not happy about. And I just wondered if anyone had any tips. Okay, um, I think, so in general, the, the best, um, the best, um, uh, way to try to, to, to address that would be to be assessed by a physiotherapist that can assess your walking because you have to bear in mind that walking um, is one of the most difficult um, actions that we do. It's really, really complicated. It seems very easy when you see people walking in the street, but it's really, really complex in our brain. So it's very difficult to know how to advise you for your walking without seeing how you walk. So the best thing is that you are assessed by a neurophysiotherapist with expertise um, uh, with patients with ataxia so that they can advise you something. Also, as a general comment, I would like to say that I know it's very difficult um, to have the, the walking aids because especially you, you have the feeling like you are disabled, but I always say uh, to the patient that we need to, to get a compromise between your safety and your functionality during the day. Uh, because one of the things that we really, really want to avoid uh, in you guys is uh, the, the occurrence of falls. Uh, we have to avoid as much as possible uh, you falling. Because if you have a fall, a bad fall and a fracture, you will have to be lying down in bed for two, three weeks. And after that, your balance will be worse and it's going to take you a lot of effort to come back to the previous um, uh, level. Um, so even though you are a little bit bothered about using the walker, uh, if that makes you uh, 
um, walk uh, safer, it's a good idea. Another different thing would be that you don't feel uh, safe with a walker. That would be a different thing. Uh, but to answer your question, from my perspective, the only tip would be to be assessed by a physiotherapy who can uh, teach you uh, specific things. Okay, thank you. And, and it, it wasn't a silly question. There are no silly questions here, okay? That's also important. Um, okay, now. Another question. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm sorry. I'm actually okay. going to stop. But I'm actually going to stop the meeting now because I'm sure oh. we've all either got questions or we'll think of questions. Um, and I'm not quite sure of the best way of dealing with them. But certainly I was thinking, as John was asking this question, there are lots of people in our group who have difficulties with walking and um, have issues around walking. And I'm sure we can share experiences with you and you can ask um, questions. And, and that's one of the things that we can do with questions. And then perhaps we can find a way of uh, funneling uh, questions to some of our experts who can help us deal with things that we find um, difficult. So uh, I'm sure people are very appreciative of, um, yes. of, of you, Hector, giving, giving up your time. And, and, and because Zoom, yeah, Zoom doesn't work very well in unmuting everybody clapping or something. So, and, and what, the, what Paul Coyer did at the conference was he got us all to shake our hands and, <laughs> and show our appreciation like that. So why not do your thumbs up or shake your hands or show your appreciation to Hector. Thank and you very much. Uh, and we'll thank close the meeting. So thank you very much, Hector. Thank you. It's very, it's, it was very nice to see you, um, some of you, after several months. So thank you very much. It was nice to see you, thank you. too. That's still the way you go. <laughs> Hope to see you in January. Okay. Bye bye, Ron. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye. Thank you.